Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, as Paul continues to talk about relationships. And of course, in dealing with relationships, he deals first and foremost with our relationship with God, upon which a right relationship with God alters and corrects every other relationship that we have. Because wanting to please God, then I want to relate to people as God would have me to relate to them. And the Bible is a book that deals with relationships. And the Bible deals with all kinds of relationships. Family relationships. Employer-employee relationships. And in verse 9, we are in that employer-employee relationship where Paul says, And you masters, do the same things unto them, that is, your servants, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, and neither is their respect of persons with him. Proper relationship of an employer to an employee. You masters, he said, do the same unto them. And this is a reference to verse 8, where Paul there declares that whatever good thing any man does, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he is bond or free, whether he is a servant or a master. In all of our relationships, we have to be conscious of God and uh, doing things as pleasing God. How does God want me to react and to respond to this situation? And I have a responsibility to God, whether I be an employer or an employee. I have a responsibility to the Lord. I do it as unto the Lord. And... Uh, Ultimately, we are all of us serving the Lord. When Paul sent Onesimus, who was a runaway slave, back to his master Philemon, Paul, in his letter to Philemon, asked him to receive now Onesimus, not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. While Paul was in Rome... There in prison, there was a young man thrown into the cell with him. And he led this young man to the Lord. And then he got a little bit of the fellow's history. He had been a slave to a man by the name of Philemon. He had stolen money from Philemon and had fled, coming to Rome. And there meeting Paul, receiving Christ, he was a tremendous help to Paul. And he wanted to stay and, and be a servant to Paul, but Paul wanted him there, but would not allow him to be a servant unless Philemon would give his word to it and for it. It's interesting, as they were talking, and Paul said, what was your master's name, Philemon? Philemon, is that the one that... Yeah, in Paul says, oh, I know him. I led him to Christ, you know. And so he, he wrote to Philemon this beautiful letter of intercession, asking Philemon to forgive Onesimus the wrongs that he had done. If he owes you anything, he said, put it to my account. And it reminds you of Jesus and his marvelous intercession for us as the debt that we owe has been put to his account. And uh, so, has, as Paul said, receive him now, not as a slave any longer, but as a brother, uh, beloved in the Lord. To the Colossians, Paul wrote, Masters, or employers, give unto your servants or employees that which is just and equal, knowing also that you have a master in heaven. Under the law, there were many instructions concerning the employer-employee. In Leviticus 19.13, you shall not defraud your neighbor 
neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Now in those days you got paid daily. At the end of the day, you were to receive your wages. Uh, they weren't even to hold them overnight. In other words, uh, the way we work, you know, you work for a week and then you get your wages. Or 15 days or a month and then you get your wages. In those days, it was every night was payday. And so uh, you weren't to hold the wages even overnight. Leviticus 25, and if your brother that dwells by thee is waxen poor and he is sold to thee, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave, but as a hired hand. And as a sojourner shall he be with you, and he will serve you to the year of Jubilee. And then he shall depart from you, both he and his children with him, and shall return to his own family and unto the possession of his fathers. For they are my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt, and they shall not be sold as slaves. And thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shall fear thy God. In other words, uh, a, a gentleness, a uh, consideration uh, to those who you have employed. Deuteronomy 24, 14. You shall not oppress a hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of your brothers or of the strangers uh, that are in the land within thy gates. And then in Deuteronomy 24, 15. At his day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor, and he sets his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be a sin unto thee. So at the end of the day, pay him, uh, because he's looking forward to the pay at the end of the day, and don't withhold it. In Psalm 140, verse 12, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of of the afflicted and the right of the poor. Amos 8, 4. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ephath small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit? God's dealing with crooked merchants here. Uh, merchants that have different weights. Uh, one weight for when you buy and another one for when you sell. Uh, uh, so that uh, everything was done with the balance scales. And these guys would often have two, di they called them diverse weights. And uh, if you're selling something, your shekel would weigh, you know, so much. And if you were buying, then you'd have a different weight for your shekel. Uh, but uh, Amos is speaking out against that, saying uh, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. You're crooked in your merchandising, and God is rebuking them for that. Malachi 3, 5, And I will come near to you to judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and the adulterers and the false swearers, and against those who oppress the hireling in his wages. So look what God classifies with those who would oppress and employ. Uh, cheat them in their wages. They're classified with the adulterers and the sorcerers and those that f swear falsely. Paul tells the masters not to threaten their servants here. He said, uh, forbearing Threatening. I think that this forbearing threatening is, is a good rule not only for an employer-employee relationship, but I think especially with parents and children. I think that so many times uh, parents make a mistake in always threatening their children, threatening them with things they would never do anyhow. You be quiet or I'm going to slap your mouth shut, you know. <laughs> or I'll knock your head off. Uh, now, those are threats. 
And you should never threaten your child. Promise them. <laughs> and don't break your promise. But don't threaten. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a mistake that many parents make. They make rash threats to their children. Threats that they never intend to carry out, but uh, the child soon realizes that they are empty threats. Now, Paul goes on to say, knowing that your master also is in heaven. In other words, no man can fairly rule over another man who is not conscious of the fact that he also has a master in heaven. We must always keep this in mind. I do not have the final say. I will stand before my master and have to give an account unto him. Earlier we mentioned the synagogue in Capernaum and the centurion that helped to build that synagogue who had the servant that was ill. Uh, the Bible tells us that when he heard that Jesus was coming to his house, he sent other servants that said, don't trouble to come to the house. Uh, because I understand authority. I also am a man under authority. In other words, I'm a centurion. I'm under the authority of the general. But I have under me men. I'm in a chain of command here. And I can say to one man, go, and he goes. I can say to another, come, and he comes. I understand what authority is about. Because I am under authority. I understand that. But I have under me men. And it's important, if you're in a position of authority, to recognize that you are also under authority, if not to man, you're under the authority of God, knowing that you have a master in heaven. You may be the CEO of your corporation, and all within the corporation may have to answer to you, but you have to answer to God. And James said, but he will be judged without mercy which has showed no mercy. In whatsoever measure ye shall mete it out, it will be measured or meted back to you. you. You're the one that sets the standard for your own judgment ultimately. Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. And so it is so important in dealing with those that are under us in the chain of command, recognizing that I have a responsibility to the one who is above me and will be giving an account unto him. In Ecclesiastes 5.8 he said, If you see the oppression of the poor and violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter, for he that is higher then the highest regardeth. And there are those who are higher than they. In other words, you, you, you look at oppression of the poor. You look at a situation and you say, that's not right. It's not right that they get by with that kind of stuff. Well, he says they're not getting by with it. There is one who is higher than they are. And uh, he is regarding what's going on. Jesus gave the parable of the man who was entrusted with the master's goods, given authority. And the master went away to a far country. And he didn't return at the expected time. So that servant began to misuse his authority. He began to mistreat the fellow servants. And the master came in a time in which he was not expecting him. Caught him by surprise. 
And it said, and he was cut off and given his portion with the unbelievers. One of the real problems in our society today are those who are in positions of authority who see themselves at the top of the totem pole and do not have a sense of responsibility before God. They think that they are getting by with what they are doing and they don't take God into account. And thus they become crooked, they become perverse, they become dishonest, they become tyrants. Because they feel that they are getting by with it, that they don't have to answer to anyone for their actions. But we do. As Paul said, we have a master also in heaven. And neither is there respect of persons with him. God is just as interested in the man who is penniless as he is the man who is a multi-millionaire. God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't examine your bank account to determine your worth. Your worth to God is infinite though you may be penniless. God is no respecter of persons. With God, there are no high and mighty and low and humble. In fact, God likes to bring men off of their high perches. The Bible says, He that exalteth himself shall be abased. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. The case of Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament, who became very prideful, the greatest and most powerful ruler that ever lived, and how that God warned him of the pride that was captivating his heart, gave him a warning, but he forgot it. And one day as he was walking through the great city, beholding the hanging gardens and the glory and the beauty, he said, is this not the great Babylon which I have built? God spoke from heaven and God allowed him to experience insanity for seven seasons as he ate grass like the oxen as he lived like an animal and afterwards God restored his sanity but Nebuchadnezzar was now a humbled man and he said the God of heaven rules over the affairs of man and he is able to exalt those whom he wills and he is able to humble those who are exalted. He recognized that he was not the top of the totem pole, but that there was a God who ruled over the affairs of man. Paul writing to the Corinthians said, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yes, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. As we stand before the Lord at the foot of the cross, we all stand at the same level. No one is exalted. No one is above another. God sees us all alike. There is no respecter of persons with God. Now, that means that you are the most important person in this building as far as God is concerned. 
God doesn't have favorites. God doesn't exalt one above another. God isn't more interested in one than another. God is interested in you. You are important to him. And he desires to work his work in your life. Even though you might feel undeserving and unworthy and you look around and think, well, they are more spiritual or they are closer to God or they are more committed or whatever. God is interested in you. Well, they're smarter. They have a better education. They have more money. God's interested in you. He's not interested in who you are. He's interested in you as a person. So don't look around and denigrate yourself and say, well, I can understand why God would bless them and all, but he surely not. Yes, he is interested in you. Don't let the enemy lie to you and tell you that you're not important to God. You are. He's no respecter of persons. And that brings comfort and hope and strength because God sees me in my weaknesses in my failings. And he's interested in me. He's interested in you. Father, we thank you for your love for us and your concern and your interest in us. And Lord, though we do not understand it because we're so prone to judge people and to be respecters of persons. Lord, it's such a common thing in the world to hold in esteem the beautiful people and to shun the ugly but Lord you're no respecter of persons and Lord you love us all and we thank you for that love now Lord we pray that you'll help us that we'll be more like you and that we will not have a attitude of looking down on others because maybe they are employed by us. They're coming and doing the gardening at our house and they're of a different nationality. Oh God, Help us to be freed from making the distinctions that are so often made. And Lord, may we see one another as you see us. Equal in receiving the grace and the love and the goodness where there is neither bond nor free, high or low, rich or poor, male or female, but where Christ is all and in all. We thank you, Lord, that you are the great equalizer and that we are all made one in you. Help us, Lord to grab this concept and let it become a part of our whole thinking process and considerations. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? Next week, we start perhaps one of the most important sections of the book of Ephesians as we deal with the subject of spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is something that we are all involved with. Many times we are unconscious of its ramifications or of its existence. Many times we are looking at a situation And when we fail to recognize the spiritual nature, 
The enemy can take all kinds of advantage over us. And he can actually just whip us to shreds without our recognition that this is a spiritual battle. So one of the most important things in this spiritual warfare is to recognize the spiritual warfare, the nature of the spiritual warfare, how it can come over into the area of the flesh and how that Satan is so often seeking to cause us to think of it only in a fleshly manner because of the physical aspects of it, but behind it, to recognize that this is a work of the enemy. This is spiritual warfare. And so it's important, these next few lessons, some of the most important in the book of Ephesians, as we deal with spiritual warfare, and of course in dealing with it, seeing the weapons of our warfare and how to gain the victory in the spiritual warfare. So we encourage you to uh, make a diligent endeavor to be with us in the next few studies. I think you'll find them very beneficial in your own Christian experience as you begin to understand the nature of spiritual warfare, the weapons of the spiritual warfare, and the assured victory that is ours in the spiritual warfare. May the Lord be with you and bless and guide and direct. Oh, it's so good to be home and it's just so <laughs> good to... be with God's people and share the time together. The Lord richly bless you.